Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Numbers of Thoth. Today, we will be taking an in-depth look at the Temple of Heliopolis. The Great Mansion of Heliopolis was the name of a shrine of the solar god Atum. The sun god and creator Atum was frequently called Lord of Heliopolis. According to ancient Egyptian myths, in the Heliopolitan theology, it was in Heliopolis that Atum created the world together with the ancient group of gods, known as the Great Ennead. The sun god at Heliopolis was worshipped in the name of Re, in the form of the solar disk, and as a stone called the Ben-Ben, the Ben-Ben also represented the primeval hill, that emerged from the primordial waters, on the first day at the beginning of time. The Banu bird, a small singing bird known as a yellow wagtail, represented the sun god resting upon it. These objects all became symbols of resurrection and eternal life. The temple at Heliopolis was most probably the largest temple ever built in ancient Egypt. Four reasons we will explore in this film, its full extent and treasures, have yet to be fully understood by Egyptologists. However, we do know that Heliopolis played a vital part in the lives of all the ancient Egyptian kings, for over 3,000 years. We can see the importance of Heliopolis to the royal funeral cult, in a pyramid text that speaks of the dead pharaoh being purified by Atum, in the Heliopolitan gnome, and as having come into existence and grown tall there. Atum is then asked to enclose the dead king in his embrace, to make him a son of the god's body forever. This passage suggests the deceased king was thought to be reborn and to join to the sun god by being cleansed in his sacred pool in the house of the Pyramidium at Heliopolis. It seems likely that ritual cleansing like this was used during the life of the pharaoh. By bathing in the sacred pool, the pharaoh became son of Re, thus allowing Re to visit the queen in the guise of her husband so that he could begat the next heir to the throne, who would be born son of Re. Heliopolis is a Greek name. It means Sun City. It was the capital of the 13th gnome of Lower Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, it was called Yunu or the place of pillars and the place of the seers. Although what the seers saw or predicted is unknown. For more than 3,000 years, Heliopolis was dedicated to worshipping the sun god Re, who was believed to reside within the temple's sacred temenos. What remains of the main temple area now lies under the Materia district of northern Cairo. The architectural layout and the landscape of Heliopolis are hot topics of much debate in the world of Egyptology. What remains of Heliopolis are now covered by between 6 and 20 feet of soil and debris. It's extraordinary that one of the most famous cities of the ancient world is now a ghost of a name, says Egyptologist Stephen Quirk the head of the Petri Museum at the University of London. Both the city and the temple have been ravaged by history. By the 2nd century BC, the city was abandoned for reasons archaeologists still don't understand. The first wave of destruction came when the Assyrians and Kushites clashed there in the 7th century BC. In the Roman period its walls and sanctuaries were plundered and stripped of anything that could be burned or reused to build Cairo or decorate Rome. What remained after that was destroyed in a succession of battles and by systematic robbing. The Arabs defeated the Byzantines in AD 640 at the Battle of Heliopolis. More of the temple's masonry was taken away in the 11th century to bolster the defenses of old Cairo and the French fought the Mamelukes at Heliopolis in 1800. As the years went by, the city's buildings and temples, obelisks and pillars were either used as building stone or removed to adorn the city squares of Paris, London and New York. By the mid-1800s, the once great city of Heliopolis had all but vanished under the silts of successive Nile floods. Only the obelisk of Sesostris I and the enclosing walls dating to the 2nd century before Christ were left in place. Sesostris's obelisk has been restored to its full glory of 67 feet or 39 cubits tall. Sesostris was the second pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. 
He ruled from 1971 to 1926 BC and was one of the most powerful kings of this dynasty. He was known by his prenomen, Kepaker, which means the car of Ray is created. His age was one of expansion and plenty. The first systematic excavation at Heliopolis took place in 1903 to 1906 under the direction of the Italian Egyptologist Ernesto Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli discovered relief fragments, including a partially preserved representation of the third dynasty King Dosa. One of Netjuriket's reliefs from Heliopolis bears the royal serek, with a detailed representation of a gate with panels and squares. Another shows the monarch enthroned holding what looks like the remains of a flail. He is accompanied by three royal women. Whether the relief is an accurate depiction of the king himself, surrounded by the female members of his household, is unknown, but its composition is remarkable for its complexity. The king appears to be ready to perform the said festival. The festival of royal renewal that was celebrated after 30 years of reign. The necropolis of the Mnevisbul cult at Arab El Tavila was explored by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities in 1902. The Mnevisbul was distinguished from other bulls by its appearance. It is described as a large black bull with enormous testicles and a high neck bulge. Usually, the bull also wears a solar disc between its horns. The Mnevisbul was closely associated with the sun god and was believed to be the embodiment of the bar of the god Ray. This is shown by his epithets. The Black Bull was known as Great God, Lord of Heaven, Ruler of Heliopolis, and had the title Herald of Ray, who raises map to Atom. In the role of Herald, the Mnevis Bull was consulted as an oracle and was considered the mediator between the gods and humans. Details of the Mnevis's burial rites are not known, but a Ramesside text gives us a few clues about what went on. It tells of a Memphite priest of Ptah, who was involved in the burial of both the Apis cult at Memphis and the Mnevisbul cult at Heliopolis. The text states that his job was to maintain order during the 70-day mourning period in each city. So, the Memphite priesthood was also involved in the funeral rites of the Heliopolitan Mnevisbul. After the burial, a new Mnevisbul sharing the same physical attributes, was selected and brought to the temple in much the same way as the better known Apis bull. The chosen animal would live a pampered life at the temple until it died or was ritually slaughtered. During its lifetime, it would be paraded in celebrations and processions called enthronements. The bull was worshipped at the Iwan pillar, a wooden pillar with a bull's skull with horns on top. In the winter of 1911-12, British archaeologist William Matthew Flinders Petrie cleared the temple area near the ancient city wall, surveyed the temple precinct, and drew up the first site plan. In the process, the monumental obelisk of Senwerset was fully revealed, and blocks from another obelisk were discovered. The fragmentary remains proved to belong to the obelisk of Tutmosis III otherwise known as Tutmos the Great. Thutmoses III was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. Officially, he ruled Egypt for almost 54 years. His reign is usually dated from 1479 to 1425 BC. That is from when the king was two and until his death aged 58, 56 years later. However, during the first 22 years of his reign, he was co-regent with his stepmother and aunt, Queen Hatshepsut. Tutmos served as the head of Hatshepsut's armies until he became king in his own right. It seems that Heliopolis fell into disrepair in Hatshepsut's reign. Tutmos III built a new enclosure wall and resacralized the temple in the 47th year of his reign. Between 1916 and 1936, the elite necropolis was examined with a focus on tombs of the Old Kingdom and the late period. Work stopped during World War II, but after the war, 
The rapid expansion of Cairo from the 1950s to the 1970s led to a series of rescue excavations by the Antiquities Authority of Egypt. The work of the Antiquities Department was continued between 1976 and 1981 under the auspices of Cairo University, under the direction of Abdelaziz Saleh. Since 2012, an Egyptian-German team, led by Ayman Ashmawi, from the Ministry of Antiquities, and Dietrich Rohr, from the University of Leipzig, has been excavating in the Temple District in cooperation with I3 Mines, the Institute for Spatial Information, and Measurement Technology. The most impressive feature within the temple is a circular structure in the eastern section of the main terminos. It measures about 400 meters in diameter and is 65 meters wide. Petrie considered this structure to be a fort bank dating to the Hyksos period. Others have argued that it is the raised platform of a sanctuary called the High Sand of Heliopolis. Academics now believe the construction was probably the center of the Sun Temple. The German-led mission has been working in this archaeological area for about 15 years, exploring its many phases of rebuilding. They have uncovered many basalt blocks engraved with the names of the gnomes of Lower Egypt, including blocks that represent the gnome of Heliopolis. They are looking for the footprint of the central temple of the sun, and to find out more about when and why the temples went out of use. Discoveries include evidence of a shrine to the god Shu, and the goddess Tefnut commissioned by Samtik II 595 to 589 BC, and a temple dated to the time of the last native pharaoh Nectanebo. Excavations between 2006 to 2010 revealed the pedestal of an unnamed colossal statue, and the large torso of a seated statue, which unfortunately also had no name. In 2017, this was followed by an even more magnificent find, it is one of the most spectacular discoveries of recent years. A colossal statue of the pharaoh Semeticus I. Standing 30 feet high, without the base the statue commemorates a pharaoh who rebuilt the Egyptian state after many years of war. Semeticus liberated Lower Egypt from Assyrian domination. He succeeded in uniting Lower and Upper Egypt in his ninth year of reign, but was unable to carry out the state reforms required to stabilize Egypt for the longer term. Semitic, I could only rely on the army as a state-preserving power. Since the army consisted largely of Greek mercenaries, his reign marked the beginning of an epoch of strong Greek influence in Egypt. If you have enjoyed this brief excursion through the excavations at the temple site at Heliopolis, and you want to find out more about ancient Egypt, please subscribe and press the like button. Thank you for watching. See you next time for another adventure in ancient history.